Today, we're discussing the Treasury Yield Stress Point. Very important for anyone who's interested in capital markets or the macro economy, basically understanding what has happened over the past 12 months. I mean, it's been a crazy past year. I think we all understand that, but especially when you're studying capital markets, when you're looking at the macro economy, let's get right into it. So essentially, when you're looking at last year, in 2020, it was right around Q, Q1 and Q2 where you saw actually a deflationary cycle. Now, this may be a little bit confusing to people, this is not the topic of this video, whether inflation, deflation, or stagflation. I'm happy to discuss this in another video, but I hope you understand at least the basics of deflation moving into this because this is a bit more advanced. But um, again, let me know in the comments if you don't understand that and I can make another video on deflation versus inflation or deflation versus stagflation, all these kind of three different factors. <clears throat> so Q1 and two, Q2, we saw this. But Q3 is where we started to see this inflationary cycle. The reason this was is because we haven't seen fiscal and monetary stimulus of this size since World War II. So this is absolutely insane, again, when you're just studying the historical market cycles, because this is truly a situation where it's, it's, it's kind of untraveled land, right? You know, we don't know exactly how this is gonna play out, but this is, this is what's important to identify at least is what's going on, so you have a framework moving into why we're discussing the treasury yield stress point and how you know quantitative easing really works. So if you don't understand basically these kind of two main weighing factors kind of balancing on the scale <clears throat> of quantitative easing, we'll all go ahead and explain that. With this, you have to understand base versus broad money, also the Federal Reserve and the Treasury and how these things are really kind of separate, <clears throat> but they again work together kind of on this balancing scale. So if you're looking at this, the Federal Reserve can't really affect broad money. They can affect base money. Essentially, the way they do this is creating new stimulus, so essentially printing money and essentially buying assets. So typically they buy bonds, but they do buy other assets. You can look at the Federal Reserve balance sheet. I've been considering doing a video on this just because it's a fascinating topic for anyone who's interested in the macro economy. I always recommend The Creature of Jekyll Island, this very in interesting and important book on the creation of the Federal Reserve and how nothing about it is really federal and nothing about it is a reserve. So again, that's a great book. Highly recommend it is a long one, but it's a great one. So again, they're just really affecting base money supply there. And the treasury, if, if, if they're not truly working together, so if the Federal Reserve, the whole point is, is kind of like church and state. So if, if the person controlling the treasury is the same person as the person that controls the Fed, we have big problems. And this is where, you know, if you, especially if you look at, okay, Janet Yellen was a former uh, Fed chairman. So this kind of causes for a little bit of concern and why we have this treasury uh, yield point. Um, and it's very important to understand that, again, the Federal Reserve, just kind of make sure you understand this, the Federal Reserve can only affect this base money supply by purchasing assets, okay? So the treasury is the one that can actually send money out to people. And, and this is what is so important to understand is when they're sending the money out, they're not, the, the treasury themselves isn't the one issuing this new currency. Rather, they have to issue bonds on this. So this is where you see, okay, what is this disconnect going on? What is this kind of funny money situation? And so many people get this confused. So many people just think money printer go burn. No, no, no. It's very, very different than this. That's why I think the, there's the, kind of this problem when people don't really dig into macroeconomics is you have, again, this balancing scale. So the Federal Reserve isn't the one sending out the checks to people. And they aren't the one, ones issuing bonds. They're, the, they're kind of the purchasers of these assets. The Treasury is the one issuing these bonds. And for, for all the money they're sending out to people, they have to issue these bonds. So again, this is really just moving money around. This isn't really creating new money. So you can kind of think of the Federal Reserve as, okay, they're creating this new money to buy these assets, okay? So they're adding onto the Fed balance sheet, which is, again, a very interesting topic in and of itself. And the treasury isn't creating new, isn't creating any new currency. Rather, they're issuing new bonds to send out to the public. And in this, again, you can go much more in detail with this, but this is just the basics of this. Um, you know, I could do literally an hour video just on the Federal Reserve or just on the treasury. And again, what you have to understand is they're just shifting money around. So this is kind of like, you know, you're, you're in a pool and we're just moving the water around. Nobody's dumping new water in because things are just kind of getting shifted around. And this is why you can kind of see this detachment from the actual, like, like you go to your local store maybe in the US and you see that it's shut down. Okay, why is that shut down? But the stock market, the capital markets are going ballistic. Well, it's, it's really this disconnect and this rising gap in inequality is, as far as uh, the, really the, the full, full economy goes. So you have the markets and then the actual economy. We see incredible 
rises and incredible is not a good thing. I'm just saying incredible. If you just look at it on a chart, it's a pretty incredible rise in unemployment. Obviously this is not a good thing, but it's very, very important to understand that when you see this rise in unemployment, when you see this rise in businesses being shut down, but you see this rise in the capital markets, you have to understand, okay, something's going on here and I don't quite understand it. And that's why I think this video is so important. So if you enjoy it so far, let me know in the comments down below. Again, we'll kind of move on forward from this, but uh, let me know in the comments. Also like the video because this is something that is, is a topic where so many people that just have the flashy object syndrome that they just want to, you know, get rich quick, don't take into account the macro economy. And I think it's vital to understand these things. So you have it as kind of a framework for throughout the rest of your life, because if you really want to be close to the, where the money is, which is in capital markets, you have to understand the kind of underpinnings of how the system works. Just like, you know, if you're playing monopoly and you have no idea how the rules work, well, how can you really form a strategy? Well, you need to, nobody, not a lot of people understand the rules of the game of capital markets or the economy in general. So moving on, now you can understand how in combination the Federal Reserve and the Treasury can increase broad money supply. But again, in a vacuum, neither of them can. This is again, kind of the whole idea when you're setting up a government, when you're setting up a financial system is you have to have checks and balances. But again, when you kind of have this, this, uh, what would you call it? Uh, it's like, a li not lion in the chicken scoop, is it like coyote in the chicken scoop maybe <laughs> with Janet Yellen in the treasury now, uh, where she was a former Fed chairman. Let me know if you know what I'm talking about. It's something in the chicken coop. It's like, uh, maybe like cat in the chicken coop. Essentially, you kind of have a someone who's, who's gotten inside this very important area that is not the not the nicest as far as the, the, the global economy. And again, this is, maybe you could say like wolf in a, I don't know, coyote in a chicken scoop anyways. <laughs> So uh, with this, again, in a vacuum, neither of these can increase broad money supply. But when they're working together, they can effectively do this. And how do they do this? Well, just as I was laying out before, you have the Federal Reserve issuing new base money to purchase assets with. So they got this charged up. Now the Treasury creates new bonds for this to happen. And when these kind of combine together, now you have this increase in broad money supply. And just for a little bit of context, in 2020, the Treasury debt was $23 trillion. And just a couple of months ago, we saw the, the reporting numbers um, here at the beginning of 2021, $28 trillion. Insane. So many people, this is, when, when you say a trillion or a billion, it's hard to really wrap your mind around this. It's, it's so, people get confused by a million, but it's, it's just like one of these things where it's like a mathematical, because we, we talk about this numerical uh, value in words. It's, it's, it's so hard to, again, wrap your head around it. Like, a trillion sounds similar to a billion, right? You change one of the letters. But again, to truly conceptualize this is very hard to do. And that's why spending time in the capital market, spending time studying the macro economy is vital. Because you really have to understand, again, these differences, <laughs> these exponential differences from a billion to a trillion. And, and again, even if you think you understand it, I really don't think anyone has a proper conceptualization of this. A trillion dollars is just mind blowing. Like it is, again, you could literally contemplate this for weeks, months, years. <laughs> going adding five trillion dollars in one year is insane okay so if, if we kind of move on from here what you have to understand is what is going to happen next what is this treasury yield stress point that's what we're going to discuss so there are really two types of yield curve controls that we'll be talking about but first just to understand if, if you're not familiar with what is yield control what is yield curve control well essentially when you're looking at this yield is referring to different assets so typically bonds again issued by the treasury but the Federal Reserve is the one purchasing up these bonds. So ask, you know, ask your, ask your uh, average millennial, are they buying bonds? Typically, no, they're, they're on Robinhood trading Tesla. So what you understand is who are the people buying these bonds? This is where it gets very interesting because the, the people buying these bonds are again, in kind of the, the same cahoots with the people who are controlling this yield curve. <clears throat> and the reason I call it this, this stress, this yield point stress, is what we'll talk about here in a second. These, these two different ways to do this. They're essentially forced in the situation where they have to act, they have to do something. It's, it's not this, this situation where you just are gonna to continue to see, see stagflation. It is, at a certain point, it's gonna break up or break down. Now, yes, the mar it, we can continue to see the inflation in this bubble. We can see the bubble continue to deflate <clears throat> and we can see a mixture between these two things. But at a certain point, this bubble will pop and it will not be good because again, we see this detachment from, <clears throat> seeing great depression levels of unemployment and massive amount of businesses closing while the capital markets are on new all-time highs just a, just a month ago pretty much every week we we're hitting new highs in different indices 
So again, you have to understand what this comes down to. What is really kind of the lifeblood of this industry? And in my opinion, it's the 10 year yield. You have to watch the 10 year yield and you have to watch the rates. We're going to talk about these two different ways of changing yield curve. The first is really a full spectrum approach. And an example of this would be in the 1940s. Essentially what they do is they hold rates at a steady level. <clears throat> When they're doing this, basically they're giving up independence from the treasury. So this is something where it's it's a massive problem because again, this balancing scale is very, very vital for the for the macro economy. But when you have this situation, again, they're forced into this because you have high levels of debt. So they're kind of forced in the situation where they have to decide between this approach or the pinning approach, which I'll talk about next. But again, with this, go study the capital markets in the 1940s. This is vital, again, to do. So at this period in time, they were forced to, into this situation where essentially they gave up their independence from the treasury and they had to kind of override what was going on in the bond market. And again, pinning this yield at a fixed place. And again, they can do this either with partial amounts or just the whole thing altogether. We'll see how this plays out. This is kind of one of the options. Uh, maybe I'll do another video on uh, potentially like again with with thesis investing I talk about this in the global investment framework video I have linked down below uh, Basically what I'm talking about is narratives and theses in investing and why it's very important to when you identify a narrative when you identify essentially a trend You need to think multiple steps deep. You shouldn't just have a one-size-fits-all black and white approach of, of uh, Oh, I'll buy this and sell this no, no no You have to have a plan for when one thing happens and a plan for when another things happens and then a plan for each of those things. So it's kind of like this branching tree, just like in chess, you have to think of multiple moves deep. So in my opinion, this kind of comes down to chess like deep thinking. And uh, anyways, moving on to the second one. Um, again, these are basically overviews. I could do an individual video literally just on each of these things, but just so you have a basic understanding of this. So again, with this full spectrum approach, it's like the 1940s where they just completely lose their independence from the treasury. They have essentially full lock in value on the yields. And again, they can do this partially or with the full amount. And then the last thing is they kind of are just overriding the bond market. But essentially, this is the front end pin. So really what this is doing is continuing the independence from the treasury, which is a good thing, but really it's kind of the band-aid approach. That's why it's called the front end pin is because the focus here is on the short end of the curve. So it's not really focused on the long-term aspects. It, the, the main goal here is to essentially manipulate bond prices in hopes that when this band-aid's put on, you can fix as many things as possible, and then when the band-aid's pulled off, everything's all nice and tidy. This is, again, I could make a literally just video, probably 20 minutes just on this individual topic, but that's essentially what you want to understand with the front end pin. It's, it's on the, the short end of the, the, the yield, which is very, very important to understand. And again, if you, don't, if you don't understand the short end or the long end of the yield, just let me know in the comments so I can do a video on this. But these two approaches are what is most important to factor in. And really, it's, it's this, this, again, this whole macro idea of this balance, these checks and balances, this kind of scale that you do not <clears throat> want to see this in massive increase in base money supply, or sorry, in broad money supply. Each of these can kind of manipulate the base money supply. But if you see this massive rise in broad, this is when inflation happens. And while these things are kind of happening, we're just kind of this balancing scale right now with the band-aid, for example, the short end of the, uh, <clears throat> the the short end of the yield curve, if you did the front end pin, we could see something like a deflationary environment, maybe a little bit of stagflation. But if we see the other situation play out the full spectrum approach, we could see a lot of inflation happening. So again, this is kind of what it comes down to with the yield, uh, the treasury yield stress point. I know it was a long video. I hope you enjoyed it with macroeconomics. Uh, very important to take these things into account. Definitely rewatch this video or let me know in the comments if you want to see different topics on the macro economy. Uh, as always, if you enjoyed it, like, subscribe, button all, invest global, and until next time.